Hello, everyone. Since this is either a highlight, a standalone book, or the first episode in a series, I'm jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal. We do not read books about real people, and we are not reading historical fiction. The second rule is that we are basing our analyses off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, nor the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come solely from personal experience. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all audiences. Please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. our journey of our three heroes who struggle to fight, unite, and overcome as the world quite literally changes around them. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And this fortnight on Books That Burn, we are discussing Rhapsody by Elizabeth Hayden. This is technically a nine book series, but it's done in trilogies. And so we're doing book one of trilogy one. Yeah, we're just going to do the first trilogy, um, but the entire series is really good, Mm -hmm. in my personal recommendation. I say, "Mm mm-hmm, I haven't read it all yet. Uh, (laughs) If it is, if it lives up to this book, then, yeah, the whole, the whole series is really good. Uh, So, Nicole assures me it does. A quick uh, note, and we're going to, we'll talk, we'll note this again at the beginning of our third topic. Uh, we are actually changing our typical order for this one recording because our minor character spotlight is severe enough that we think it warrants being talked about last in our order of escalation. So we are actually starting with main characters, topic one out of two, as our first topic. Now on to our factions. We have Meridian, Gwendian. Emily, Rhapsody, Michael, Ahmed the Snake, Grunthor, Joe, and Ash. It's Ash with the E on the end of it, so I'm not sure if it's one syllable or two. In my head, it was Ash. <laughs> Instead of Ashe. <laughs> um, yeah. I assume it's Ash, just based off of kind of the the way names are done in this in this series, at least from from reading it, how they look like they're kind of done. Yeah, the way names are done in this series appears to be fantasy coolness alternated with biblical names. Like, it's weird. Yeah. It's it's very stereotypical white American names alternated with fantasy names. Well, And then you have things like Ahmed, who, which is spelled A-C-H-M-E-D. Um, so, you know, it's, or, or you have, or you have descriptive names. Uh, Rhapsody is a musician. (laughs) Yep. She's a bard. So it just kind of depends. Um, anyways. For our main character topic one, we have Rhapsody and Emily, and we are discussing sexism. There's two big topics two main facets of this. There's the concept of virginity and then also um, sex work. And these are entangled and which is why they go together under general sexism. But they are distinctive enough that we can talk about them kind of in turn. So with Emily, we have her like, actual first time having sex 
um, canonically. And um, she also bleeds, so it, it goes into this assumption that the first time having sex um, for someone who, um, uh, for, well, in this case, Emily appears to be a cis woman, um, that this will involve blood for the very, very first event. And but it's important that's... to note in the book, it's not treated as blood means sex is violent. Just that right. the first time you have it, you will bleed and it will not be very much, but it will happen. Like there's that there's that definite assumption there. Yeah. And that's not going to be true for everybody, but the the book does have that happen. And it it kind of downplays it in this weird way, like. We're, we're we're talking about virginity as sexism partly because it's in the that's like in the book with Emily but more so with the way that the concept of virginity is constantly a topic for Rhapsody who is not a virgin um uh, by the time we're following her yeah um it's it's kind of an odd thing because so for slight clarification just cuz Robin and I decided we were going to just ahead of time uh the book uh so we are going to refer to people who make a living selling their bodies with sex as sex workers the book explicitly calls them prostitutes yeah um so just so anybody listening or looking to read this book is aware. Um, this book was actually, like, I think newer books have come out more recently, but I think I first read this series a good 10 years ago. So um, modern assumptions on what vernacular is and isn't degradation um, might have been a little bit different. Um, but also, there there's a couple of things we're going to talk about with Rhapsody in a second that very much kind of tap into that whole like no this is this is very exploitative and very uh, misogynistic intentionally written so so it might also just be intentional word choice by the author but it's still good to know you know yeah, going if into you go read this into book read this book the book is not going to be saying sex work the way we are um so um, with rhapsody with, with mm-hmm. rhapsody there's a there's kind of this assumption that um, if you have quote unquote lost your virginity, that you are damaged in some way. Uh, it's part of damage that has happened to you throughout your life. <laughs> Not saying virginity good, sex bad, but it still takes that stance as your virginity being something that is a a thing that has happened to you. And so there's a part of this book where she goes through an event that heals her of a lot and pretty much any physical trauma scars um in general um just like any any physical flaws anything that would have happened to mark her body is is healed is is literally because it's fire related is burned away and and it's talks about her like her physical appearance being refined um extra flesh is burned away her bones her cheekbones are more visible um like again like her scars are burned away her fingers appear longer but in this transformation she regains her virginity according to the book (laughs) yep in a physical way and because the way that it happened is a very dramatic version of something that she is regularly able to do, which is use music to heal herself and others, we then get into the sexism because her traveling companions are like, oh, when you were a sex worker, did you do this so that people could kid keep taking your virginity? And she's like, um... This is, she's like, no, and no, that is not okay. What? No. Yeah. Um, so that's the other thing about this book is that there's a lot of very troubling concepts set up. Um, but 
actually getting into our 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 thoughts on the way sex work is treated, this book actually does a very good job of having some really, really, um, I don't want to say problematic, because that word is really loaded now. Um, they, but there's some a lot really, of sexist comments and jokes. Well, there's, and- but there's, there's sexist more than just comments and jokes, just like a pervasive attitude surrounding sex work. But our main character actively calls out those people on any time she feels safe to do so, which includes uh, the, the vast majority of them that we kind of get on screen in this book kind of actually come from her, her two traveling companions who never actually try to take it like advantage of her or hurt her or anything like that. Um, but they still make assumptions and make comments and she does, she actively calls them out the entire time. But also she actively calls them out for the entire length of the book and <laughs> yeah like it doesn't given, it doesn't get it gets better uh, eventually given the time but, scale involved and that's all I'm going to say there given the time scale involved that they are still making these comments it's at only like a year or two in, book, in life experience yeah it's not but, actually that it's not actually that long of a time period Okay. Um, I it's understand maybe a year. They, they didn't have a good sense of the time passing, but that they were living through it. But uh, whichever. Living Still, through it. a year, yeah. uh, it, it, an experiential year of traveling with them. And yeah. they're still making these jokes at the end of it. Yeah. It's like, all right, hey, come on, guys, you need, and I say guys because they're both men. Yeah. Uh <laughs> Stop it. What are you doing? Yeah, um, like, but, let it go but already. also, she doesn't, like, magically change or reform them, and that, this goes into that a little bit, like, they definitely, like, travel parallel and make each other a little bit better, but aren't fundamentally changing each other, which in terms of the book, I think is very important. It's just Oh, yeah, it's very important for the framework of the actual narrative. It's just frustrating when this is one of the things that she doesn't change in them. Well, and, then, and it's not that it's her job to change them. This is one of the things that they absolutely. don't grow on. They don't yeah. learn better. Yes, thank you for that better language. Uh, they don't grow on this issue, despite her saying, stop doing that. Over and over. Uh, and and then, then, very quickly, a um, mm-hmm. couple other things that happen with regards to sex work in general. Uh, Emily turns down a coin from her a brief suitor um, because she doesn't want her family to think that she that he paid her to have sex with him. Um, And it doesn't matter that he didn't. (laughs) The point is that that the appearance of having done so would have been enough for her to have had problems and issues. Especially when they did literally have sex and so from (laughs) her parents' perspective yes, we had sex, and no, that's not why I don't have the money. Like, that yeah. that wouldn't really fly, and she knows it wouldn't, and she turns it down. Yeah. And then also, uh, Rhapsody deals with, this is actually the thing that kind of kickstarts the the main story, is her running away from an abusive um, ex- um, uh, abusive ex-client who essentially um, back when she was was her full-time job was sex work, putting herself through school. Um, uh, he had actually paid to to enlist her services a lot and used it to abuse her. Um, and so then, you know, he con- this this thing that happens here is that he comes up to her and basically says. Uh, she basically says, like, I'm not in that business anymore. I'm not doing this anymore. Um, and his response is essentially once, like, I've paid to have sex with you one time, therefore I get free sex with you forever if you've left the business. Like, you're my property. I paid for you. I own you. It goes a little bit further than that because he is not around her, but where we get to see him do this, he is offering her body 
to one of his subordinates. Oh yeah, saying, he like, thinks of her as a literal her. piece of property. Yeah. Yeah. But it's but it stems out of this attitude of I paid for your services, which means I paid for you, which means I own you, which means I decide who you have sex with and my decision is that you are always available to me. And her response is no. <laughs> and then she actually leaves. She runs away from him. Things happen, plot things happen, and then she ends up with other traveling companions. But but fleeing from an abuser is the kickstart to this narrative. Freeing, fleeing from an abuser who sees sex workers as just pieces of property to be used and abused is the kickstart to this whole entire nine book series. And that's really, I think that's important. All right. Topic two. We're at 15 minutes. <laughs> For Ahmed and Grunthor with racism. So Grunthor and Ahmed are both half Fearbolg, and then each of them is half something else. And there's a lot of racism around them being um, perceived or not perceived as Fearbolg. And I actually want to branch that out. Uh, they are Fearbolg specifically, but perceived as bulg. Right, yes. So, fear bulg being a specific kind of bulg. Yeah, a particular clan association. And so they both experience different kinds of microaggressions, where with Ahmed, people don't realize that he's fear bulg, and so they'll say racist things about bulg, and either assume he won't be upset or not worry about his reaction at all because they have no reason to think that it'll mean anything in particular to him. Or, at one point, um, he actually has to choose a, essentially a mediator representative and he has a hard time uh, initially thinking of who that could be because it needs to be somebody who represents the Bulg and their the things that they need represented on but it also has to be something that the racist other people would take some of the racist other people would take seriously <laughs> and there was a it's it's kind of more of a background we know that the discussion happened and not necessarily that we see it play out in the book but there was a he kind of fills um our us as readers in and 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 rhapsody who he is talking to about it with uh and he kind of fills grunther in too on that thought of like Essentially, they have to pick somebody who isn't going to immediately be uh, discriminated against, but is not like an ally or an outsider. <laughs> and that's a and that was a really hard decision. Now, this, to be fair, is in an instance where um, different races kind of don't necessarily live separately, but the two factions on this side are explicitly of the Bulg and a different neighboring kingdom that's mostly human. So um, it's it's not just as simple as for for Ahmed, it's not just as simple as like the other kingdom needing to get over their racism. <laughs> like he, he has to pick somebody to represent him that won't be shot on sight. Because they don't have time for that. And like, no, they don't. They'll die. I late. assume you're referring to the instance where Rhapsody is chosen, yes? Yeah, so they they don't have time to try and change the people's racism because they're they're trying to they're trying to prevent a slaughter which is racially motivated. And um so with with the bulk, like we're talking about Ahmed and Grunthor in particular. But they end up in a position so that um, they are with a group of Bulg who for decades, if not centuries, but at least two generations of human life, minimum, they have been being raided and killed on a yearly basis in order to prevent them coming and attacking, which they haven't done in, in decades. 
and like there I do not want to spoil their solution to it, but it's it's very like desperate and out of a like, well, we can't do anything about this because they're not going to get over hating us even though we haven't done anything to them in their living memory. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They still hate us and they still want to kill us. And and explicitly these raids are the intent the intent of them is genocide. That's the goal. And and the fact they and the fact that they don't succeed has nothing to do with their attempts <laughs> at this. Yeah. This is this is racially motivated fantasy racially motivated genocide. Yep. And so then winding back to Grunthor, because he is obviously Bolg, even if they don't know specifically that he's fear Bolg, um, people keep expecting him to conform to racial stereotypes. And because of his physicality and um, general appearance and his size, he plays into this assumption when it'll help him. But yeah, he he plays the big scary bulg who will chew your head off in a literal sense when it gets him of, what he wants. <laughs> lots of lots of comments about cannibalism. Uh, I did I did think it's inter- interesting just on a linguistic point that he it's still referred to as cannibalism when it's him talking about eating humans or um, Lyran. Yeah, and it's like oh, so cannibalism means consuming a sentient creature. Got it. Uh, I just yeah. was noticing that. Yeah. <laughs> Cannibalism is 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 killing and eating sentient other sentient beings in this book. The the way he like both uh, just the way he plays into this, um It's very much a coping mechanism at the yeah. least. Yeah, it also is mechanism. useful for him in the world where he exists. Which but... is why it works as a coping mechanism. Right. Well, not that's not just the only reason why, but like... Um... I, I assume if it didn't work for him, he might stop. But the way and the intentionality with how he deploys it is what makes me say that. Um, it's it's possible that he's just like this and it happens to work out that that's always possible i mean a, a lot of a lot of it though is not necessarily it's not necessarily bravado but it's very intentional it, it's kind of a thing where he goes you know like this is like i can play up the stereotype of being the quote unquote like worst of whatever that is being assigned to me by other by other creatures um but also in war, would I do those things? Did I do those things? Of course. Like, there, there's, there, it's, it's not, he's not oblivious at all. He's not, he's not unaware of the stereotype he's playing into. He's not unaware of, of, I mean, the society that he was brought up in and the things that he was taught to do and to be. Mm-hmm. And so, but he also he also doesn't do them nearly as often as everyone assumes that he would. Oh no, a good on screen, a good like, I don't know, eighty percent of <laughs> of what of what we see him of how we see him kind of playing into the 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 quote unquote monster monster stereotype is in, is just it's just that it's it's capitalizing on other people's racism to get done what he wants to do. And then every once in a while, you know, he does something like allow um, his army to carry off the bodies of the enemy that they've killed and eat them. <laughs> but they're not going out slaughtering civilians. He's got standards. Exactly. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's very, it's not tongue in cheek, but it's very, um, it's just very deliberate. Like, he, he, he really does. He has a code of conduct. He has a code of honor. But also, he he's very aware of how he's being treated. For Joe, we have ritual sacrifice and child abuse. Uh, um, a quick reiteration of something I stated at the beginning of our first topic. This is our minor character spotlight. 
We are putting this third. We are talking about it third because uh, in order of escalation, this is the trauma that is the least amount of background or implication and the most amount of on-screen damage to somebody done. So, (laughs) uh, both of our other topics tend to be either background or just context for things that are happening or just microaggressions happening. Um, But this one is traumatic and on screen. Yep. So, Joe, it's a really easy way to get to this. Joe was part of a group of children who were kidnapped and abused so that they would not or could not run away before being literally sacrificed. Um, When we meet her, she was held in a building, um, not as big as a castle, but like, anyway, she's held in this building where the inside and the outside of the building are filled with the corpses of children. Um, There's a bit where they consider where um, Rhapsody, Ahmed, and um, and Grunthor consider moving the children to another room and decide not to because there would be no way to move them without them walking by even more dead children. So, uh, yeah. And so part of why Joe was in this situation is that we don't know exactly where she was when she got kidnapped, but we know she'd been living on the street without parents. And, like, it feels... I don't know. Like, all the um, the sacrifice stuff feels so weighty that it almost feels trite to be like, and she never knew her parents and doesn't remember her <laughs> mom and doesn't mention a dad, but, like, it's part of this whole package of the first time she ever had a consistent place to live it was because someone was about to kill her (laughs) so um i don't know if you had anything else to add to that particular point not to that specifically yeah you want to talk about the food insecurity yeah so partly from we assume from living on the street she is has some pretty severe food insecurity. She hoards everything. Um, things that matter to her, food that she's given, she's, she eats until she's almost sick a lot. <laughs> um, she has her own, like, her own treasures, her own trinkets that she's collected, hoarded. Um, and and I, I put it that way instead of saying she has her own things, because it's not always her stuff. <laughs> Um, Because she's also a pickpocket. She's also a pickpocket. So she is literally grabbing and taking things that she thinks are cool because she can't and doesn't feel or doesn't feel like she could ask or get them any other way. And And there's a lot of tension that happens with Ahmed where he's like, I can't trust you because you did this behavior that shows you are obviously abused and lived on the street and she's like, well, if you're saying you don't... Or the implication, she doesn't talk back with this, but the implication is that her thought would be, well, you showed that I was right because you now you don't want to give me things, so I yeah. didn't need to take it. It's got that tension there. <laughs> there's there's a really actually very interesting dynamic in, in Joe and Ahmed's um, uh, a relationship in the book because... Both of them, for very different reasons, uh, have a hard time trusting people in general. Um, And both of their traumas kind of butt up against each other. (laughs) Ahmed doesn't trust people to leave him alone. And he doesn't trust people to touch his stuff. Just in general. He doesn't want anyone opening his bags, going through his things touching stuff that he has that is potentially magical or dangerous or harmful or toxic or poisonous. Um, both because he doesn't want his stuff messed with, but also he just doesn't trust other people touching his belongings. Joe is a, a pickpocket. She is a, um, she's a, she's a thief. She 
grab. She steals food. She steals trinkets. She steals things that she thinks are cool because she's never had the ability to get things and survive any other way that we know she about. Tries, she tries so, to pickpocket someone ten minutes after Rhapsody hands her money and says, we are in a market, please don't pickpocket. Here is money to buy things. Yeah. And she still tries to pickpocket. But she still does it, because what if the money is gone and I couldn't get that thing anymore? Yeah. Uh, like, or I can get, and- if I get the thing without spending the money, then I'll have the thing and money to get more things later. Right. And, and so Rhapsody, or I'm sorry, not Rhapsody. So Joe and, and Ahmed really butt, butt heads because Joe doesn't trust Ahmed because she hasn't pickpocketed him, so she can't be sure that he's not dangerous to her. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> that's her, lo- that that's way, her logic. Right. That's her logic. Ahmed doesn't trust Joe because she won't stop trying to touch his stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and they really like, I mean, that they, that both coming from both directions, both of them are pretty severely traumatized at this point in their lives. And both of them, they they don't trust each other because of the other one's reaction to their own trauma. And it's it's really, especially as someone who has read this whole series, in this first book, it is a wildly rocky relationship from the mm-hmm. jump. Um, and, and not because either one of them, like, you know, Ahmed legitimately does try to give Joe a chance more than he would pretty much anybody else in his life like if he had caught essentially anybody (laughs) other than joe trying to trying to steal from him they he would have killed them they would have been dead they wouldn't have gotten close enough to really try if they got close enough to try he would have murdered them on the spot but he gives joe multiple chances he actively tries to to see her as a child he actively tries to see her as as somebody who is in pain and abused and and needs help um he actively tries to 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 educate her to help her to figure out how to function not immediately not at first but but he gets there but it but it is really like interesting to see them kind of go up against each other and and <laughs> i mean trying to figure this stuff out so just so no one thinks but you didn't call this topic food insecurity. Um, that all yeah. is wrapped under the child abuse half of this topic. And we promise we're not alighting over the ritual sacrifice. It's just that it's <laughs> there. It happened. It's it was, kind of a lot. But the yeah. book doesn't spend a lot of time dwelling on it. No, um, they spend way more time on the after effects of the abuse that Joe has gone through in various ways. Which I think is the right balance to have on that. Um, Cause you don't need to spend a lot of time there to know that it was very terrible. Um, I'm sure this will come up in our wrap up, but like, it's not blink and you'll miss it, but it's no, no, it's definitely not, um, but it's also not, the thing that everybody else focuses on. It's just kind of part of how they found her, and then it's part of a thing that they try to stop from happening again, and that's kind of it. (laughs) So. Hello, mortals, and welcome to Half Damage, a Curse of Strahd actual play podcast with a twist like no other. Listen if you dare. For only horror and pain lurk inside. It seems to be growing lollipops for some I'm reason. Starting to cry. I'm so happy. <laughs> uh, no, 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 that's not what I. Can, can we roll this? I have stared into the abyss, and the abyss has frosted tips. <laughs> <laughs> that is clearly not what I want. I squeezed cheese, Jerry. If you, I'm hovering on the doorway of Flavor Town. <laughs> Jerry, you cut this out right now or I swear! Where there was nothing there before now hangs a lifeless grey body that fixes its dead eyes upon you. Or more accurately, fixes your dead eyes upon no, you. No, no, no! <clears throat> and that's more like it. Vent veteran, if you think you have the stomach for it. Find Half Damage on all podcast apps or on iTunes under podcasts. I can't wait for you to enter my domain. Jerry, you're so f***ing fired.
on to the wrap up and ratings for um sexism what is the gratuity rating backstory off screen mild moderate or severe uh i honestly want to say a lot of it is backstory and moderate okay that's my argument a lot of it is just microaggressions and people being called out for those microaggressions but then we have the backstory of some more severe things. Um, but also, it doesn't the microaggressions don't really stop all book. <laughs> right. So I, I'm, I'm leaning toward moderate because the severe things are off screen slash backstory. Sure. That and we don't sense. get explicit details in this book. Right. Um, for racism, I think this is either moderate or severe because... I think it's severe because it ends in a lot of death. Yeah. <laughs> That's my that argument. Is, that is what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> for for most of the book, it's moderate. Most of the book, then... it's kind of the same as the sexism. It's just a lot exactly. of microaggression. It's a lot of, here's yep. the backstory that you don't understand, which is why your comment is a problem. And then it ramps up into people have died because other people want to be racist. Uh, and we should point out now that this is the this is the uh, recap. This is our 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 ratings section, and people might not have listened to the the actual um, segment. This is fantasy racism. <laughs> uh, so, if racism is a trigger for you in books, um, this is not human racism against other humans. This is specifically fantasy races being racist against each other. Which I know for some people that that makes a difference on what they can handle reading. Um, but also I should point out, just like um, a lot of the on-screen sexism, the racism in this book the entire time is spent being called out by characters who are experiencing it. Yeah, pretty immediate. It's not just a a book about them suffering because they're being um, systematically discriminated against. It is them saying, hey, so that thing that you said, <laughs> that thing that you're doing, this assumption you're making is actively harmful, and here's why, and pushing back directly against it. But it's also not an instance in either one of these segments of the um, perpetrator of either sexism or racism being given a free pass and forgiven immediately. Oh, definitely That does not, not happen. Um, how do you want to refer to this last topic? Because we've got two options. <sighs> I, both. Child abuse and ritual sacrifice. It's kind of... Okay. All right. It's yep, everything that's... that our one character goes through. <laughs> yep. All right. Um, so, for the... Child abuse and ritual sacrifice. Uh, when it's on screen, um, it's pretty severe. It's severe. Yeah, it's severe in it's severe in backstory. I I want to be clear since we do have this rating as an option. It is not torture porn. It is no. not. It's not taken um, lightly. It is not. Um, it's not set up as desirable or interesting to watch or anything sympathetic so it doesn't sympathetic it doesn't elide over it but it also doesn't linger so whether that's something you can handle just depends but when it's there it is severe so please um take care of yourselves for the uh integral interchangeable or irrelevant ratings sexism Integral, interchangeable, or irrelevant? I know my opinion. Yeah, integral. Um, kind of defining thing in the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> kick, kick, um, a particular event related to this topic kicks off the plot, as we said in our segment. Yep. Um, uh, racism. Also integral. So yeah, sexism wait. kicks off the plot. Racism concludes the plot. <laughs> That's what I was about to say. The plot uh, wouldn't happen without one of these two. Oh, boy, we really picked the right topics because the uh, child abuse and ritual sacrifice is I'm, the middle of the plot. It's the middle of the plot. And it's also integral. Um, you know, if we had flipped our second main character topic and our minor topic, we would have these in plot order. Yeah, we put them in escalation order instead of plot order. 
But I will say this, if you take out the one instance of ritual sacrifice and just make it child abuse, it would probably be an order of escalation in plot order. Yeah, definitely. Like that's and and I will say this, pretty consistent across these books. Like that's not <laughs> we enough might to end make up me... talking about these in plot order <laughs> and for every topic. I potentially, unless we pick ones that are not like, like it's main not themes enough or whatever. to make me want to like re-record and do that, but it's no, enough to make no, no, me no. wish I'd realized so that we could have structured the episode on purpose to take advantage of that. It's I, fine. I still don't I'm think that would have what... been good because our major, yeah. our major descriptive, descriptive graphic event this is, is still our minor character, and that should still have needed to be last in, in order of escalation. But uh, that's one moment. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, but the overarching ideal ideas of things that are happening in this book definitely ramp as you go. Treated for with care. Care, yes. Um, I think enough. For sexism... Okay, I, Honestly, but- I'm going to make an argument that both sexism and racism are treated with enough care. Because there are some pretty explicit things said. But kind of like we've stated every single time the characters that they are being set against, the characters that are experiencing those things, immediately call them out and are and are pretty immediately uh, emotionally backed up and taken care of by their companions and friends at the time. I do have a little pushback on that because for these topics, I don't feel like someone immediately after saying hey that's not okay is quite enough to make the actual no um, but that's why i'm saying it's more than that okay it's hey you saying that wasn't okay and then the other person goes oh okay tell me why so i can do different and they don't necessarily reverse course and learn from it immediately but the, but the same comment from the same person doesn't happen again. And this is very much an instance of like, this is very much an instance of the difference between the character experiencing versus something somebody reading it. It's a very different reading experience to just watch microaggressions happening to somebody in a way that feels like it, it could be happening to you than it is to watch them have it happen, have it immediately called out, and then have it matter to the story that somebody else is caring about these things happening. Okay. So, like, and, and I, specifically, like, um, I'm not keeping spoilers out about it, but we talked about the ambassadorial appointment. Uh, that only worked because that character is now advocating for a a another character that. Oh, that's true because. That they wouldn't have had the perspective to do at the beginning of the book. Absolutely. Okay, that makes sense. And was trusted um, to do that. And it's not that character inserting their voice in as an ally. It's that character literally delivering the words of the person who is being discriminated against. I I think it's enough because I of how it's handled overarchingly. <laughs> okay. Um, That's my argument. <laughs> okay, so I can go with you on probably enough, but it's 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 possible it's a kind of your mileage may vary thing yeah it's gonna range somewhere between not enough and enough and we can't speak for you on which one of those it's gonna be for you but you'll you'll know pretty quickly um because it's pretty early on in the book so if it's not enough care for you and you need to stop I'm sad you'll miss the rest of the book, but but stop. It's fine. It's okay. Like, don't worry about it. Because um, this this book's definitely this book definitely ramps up. Then, for the child abuse and ritual sacrifice, I nope, not enough. Like, there's care taken, but it's it's not enough. These are these are pretty rough. For point of view, 
for sexism, we have the perspective of the person most of the time. Same for racism, um, because the book switches narrators, depending on each individual instance, it might, we might be following the person saying the sexist or racist thing, and we might be following the person hearing it. It bounces back and forth pretty often. Yeah. So, it just... It depends. They're all main characters. Most of the events, a main character is either saying the thing or receiving the thing. Um, that also led to a very interesting dynamic where you had one main character or two main characters who were consistently sexist and one main character who, at least initially, was consistently racist. Um, yeah. And then they kind of mutually. Mutually stopped being that. gross to each other. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, that was good. Um, but yeah, so that makes the point of view a little bit complicated to talk about there. But for the ritual sacrifice and child abuse, it is the point of view of someone who did not go through that. Yeah, it's mostly just Rhapsody. Yeah, for, for those sections. Um, point of view of the aftermath. So this actually changes slightly. I actually think it flips. I think we get Ahmed and Grunthor as the point of view for the aftermath of the sexism, and we get Rhapsody for the point of view of the aftermath of the racism. Oh, okay. I think it flips. Because we very much get a uh, an instance of initial incidents, you get the point of view of the person experiencing it, and then once the other person is an advocate for the person who was experiencing it, you now get them noticing it happening to their companion. You actually get both. Which is honestly, narratively a very... It, it, that's a, I, I like it. <laughs> I don't want to blanket say it's a good way to do it, but um, it, it means that you have both somebody experiencing these microaggressions or these this discrimination... And you get their perspective as it happens, and then you get their companions protecting them when it would happen again, which is which is an interesting and a, a nice way to see it from the perspective angle. Uh, that being said, for point of view of the aftermath of uh, ritual sacrifice and child abuse, we still only get Rhapsody. We never really get Joe... Not not in any long-term talking, thinking through it herself kind of a way. We never really get her perspective on it. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I would have liked to get Joe's thoughts, but I think part of her characterization here that makes it very effective is that we don't get to find out exactly what she's thinking. Do you have an aspiring writer tip? Aspiring writer tip. Um, I mean, the biggest one that stands out to me is that this book has three main characters, three narrators. They're not even narrators, because it's really written in third person. Um, but three main points of view perspective. And none of those three... I think we were actually talking about this before. None of those three really are upheld as, like, the the good guy <laughs> um our our female character is starts out with some pretty racist points of view um our two male non-human characters start out with some pretty sexist points of view um they start out with like giant information gaps in their their knowledge bases they start out not really working together you know but but none of them are the hero that comes in to save everybody. They're all just very different pieces of a puzzle. So I I don't know. That's that's the thing that kind of jumps out at me. That it's not always the same in every book. So I have a different aspiring writer tip. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, I just, normally it's only one of us that has well, one, but well, I actually have one. Well, normally we had talked about you, like, turning it into one, but I don't know how to do that with mine. No, sure. No, but, like, I, I have I have a different one that I'm very okay. excited about. So, there's a section in this book where something takes an extremely long time, and without being boring, 
it effectively conveys a sense of monotony and I don't know how to describe it better than that but it 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 worked really really well and I think the tip would be that if you are going to if you want to convey that something took a very long time you can't you need to devote enough of a segment to the book that it takes a bit for the reader to get through. Um, Now, doing that without being boring, obviously, is the trick, and I'm sorry I'm not very much help there. But it really meant that then when we find out how much time this took, I I, I felt it. It made sense. I was like, oh, yeah, because that completely matches with all of this narration and all this stuff. Absolutely. Like, I, I felt that time. and It was believable. It was a shock while also being believable. It, it, it didn't it didn't break my... Sus- but it was a shock to the characters, too, when they realized what was happening. Absolutely. Um, so we have, like, the way time dilation is done there, it was like... Yeah, so if, if you're going to have something take a long time, don't be afraid to show it, like actually taking a while don't be monotonous don't be super repetitive but um but yeah uh give give long even if they're kind of boring events if you give them the time needed then it'll be believable that the characters actually took a long time to do a thing um this this does not mean narrate any every step on a road journey. No. Like that's a different thing. Um, but just mm. anyway, I hope that works. This has done as really a tip. well. Yeah. Uh, what was your favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? I just like. Uh, I like that the main character is. I like the way music and magic, in general is done in this book, which I, I know is tends to be a thing that I like in a lot of our books if it's done well. Um, but I like the concept of magic being connected to a, an, a thing's essence or identity. True names and the words that people use mattering. And also, um, unlike uh, a lot of series where that use that kind of a premise... This is not a book that says you have to uncover something's true name in a, in a distant, mm-hmm. unused language. Instead, language and magic changes as vernacular changes and as context changes. And but this, book, you- this book jumps directly into that because the way you use it depends on how you mean it and how you think of it. And it's just really well done. But also, if you use the true name, that does like extra special stuff. But you can oh, yeah, still but only because without needing only that. because of what it means to the thing, basically. Right, exactly. So it's it's just a really good. I don't know. I just think it's a really, really, really cool, interesting, good take on that concept of things having a nature that's connected to them magically. My favorite non traumatic thing about the book, um. I hope this counts as non-traumatic. It was very stressful for me, but I I think it is my favorite thing. Um, ah, Gwendy and Emily. Um, ah, I, no spoilers. I, I love the prologue. Uh, waiting for the payoff was agonizing <laughs> and so um, I'm not spoiling how or whether it pays off in this book. It is worth it. You're you're ace arrow sitting over there being like, well, there's no romance clogging my adventure Trek story. Hey, you said that about me, not me. Fine, fine. That's how I think you were thinking. What were you actually thinking? Uh just that I didn't know how it fit in yet the first time I read this book. <laughs> I just didn't know what the point of it was yet because <laughs> th- we didn't know. Uh, but I will say from a slightly different perspective, as somebody who has read this series several times, um, watching you try to figure out how it connected was very entertaining. 
Yeah. Because, like, you had told me it was going to connect, and I was like, oh. I was like, oh, they'll get there. And I was like, obviously it's going to. And I I had a, a wrong answer, and then a right answer, and then about 200 pages of agonizing until I found out whether or not my second answer was right. And, um, ah, I, this is, this book does a really good job with pacing. (laughs) Yeah, it does a really good job with pacing. Um, I'm hesitating over whether I can call this non-traumatic. It was very stressful for me, but it is technically not a traumatic thing. It's not traumatic in the book. (laughs) In the book? Ah, okay. That's other than incoherent screaming and a need to get to book two as soon as I can. (laughs) All music used in this podcast was created by Nicole as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. You can follow us on Twitter at Books That Burn, all one word. You can email us with questions, comments, or book recommendations at books that burn at yahoo.com support us on patreon.com slash books that burn all patrons get access to our upcoming book list and receive a one-time shout out you can leave us an itunes review this helps people to find the show and find us on itunes stitcher google play or wherever you get your podcasts thanks for listening we'll be back in two weeks